Thank you, Bill, for those words, for your leadership, your mediatorship, moderatorship, uh, and most importantly to me, and I know many in this room, <clears throat> for your friendship, uh, not only to this city, but to this festival. Thank you so so much. thank you. Um, what a joy it is to be back home. <laughs> it feels really good. So thank you. Uh, I am uh, at the three month mark and uh, I'm adjusting. Uh, it took me a little too long to switch my iPhone's autocorrect feature to American English from English English. And I'll just put it this way. Um, when you are writing to an American friend and you spell the word humor with a U, they uh, don't find it that funny. <laughs> it's uh, kind of pretentious. Uh, so I'm adjusting. And uh, I think back to how I tried to adjust to life in England three and a half years ago and adjusting to English English. Uh, and the hardest thing for me from the beginning and all the way through was British understatement. And this was really brought home for me uh, in the first few weeks of arriving in London. There was this massive storm on the south coast of England. I mean, people are getting swept away to sea. It was the real deal. And I'm watching the TV, and there's a weather reporter for the BBC. And she's standing on the Brighton Pier. And huge waves are crashing, and she's got her foul weather gear. And she signs off, and she looks at the camera, and she says, Hi, this is Jane Smith from the BBC, from the Brighton Pier, where it is not overly safe. <laughs> I mean, who says that? <laughs> I mean, you guys say that, but think about what a CNN equivalent would say, right? It's mayhem, it's chaos, you know? Uh, so this has been hard uh, for me, but even here in American, and even by American standards, it is hard to overemphasize my indebtedness to one person on this panel, and that is Karen. And you don't know this, Karen. I didn't say this when we were chatting downstairs, but uh, I was raised in a little waspy New England town outside of Boston, not far from where Noah lives. And uh, my uh, father was sort of somewhere between agnostic and atheist, and he didn't want any of his four children uh, baptized. And then my parents got divorced when I was 11, and my mom turned to all four of us, and she said, you guys can get baptized now. And my older sister said, yes. And my little sister said, yes. And my little brother said, yes. And I said, no. <laughs> and then I went to an Episcopal boarding school and we had chapel every morning and it was one of those chapels where you long skinny rows and you face your other students and you face more importantly all the faculty who look at you every day and I sat there every morning arms folded and I never sang a hymn and I never said a prayer and I never said amen and I was proud of it <laughs> and then fast forward to graduation day uh, from college and my mother gives me the newly published best-selling book, A History of God, by none other than Karen. And she said, I know you don't believe this kind of stuff yet, but uh, please keep your heart open. And I don't know whether I kept my heart open or not. I know that I didn't open the book. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's true, I didn't. And, um, and then fast forward five more years, and I meet the love of my life, my now wife, Brooke, who I think is somewhere here. Um, we fall in love, we decide to get married, and she was raised by Christy and her wonderful father uh, in a religious household, and she wanted to get married in a church. And it wasn't only a church, it was a cathedral, and it wasn't only a cathedral, it was a Catholic cathedral. <laughs> So I had to start somewhere, and why not start at the beginning? So I picked up A History of God, and that led me to G.K. Chesterton, An Everlasting Man, and that led me to C.S. Lewis, and then C.S. Lewis led me to Dorothy Sayers and Mind of the Maker. And then finally, 10 years ago, uh, right around now, I was baptized right in the uh, CIR interfaith garden a few blocks away from here. So that is a long-winded way of saying thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So Sarah said in her kind remarks that this panel represented the best and the brightest. I would argue we have the best in Karen and we have the brightest in Noah. Now you might say, well, that's a hard thing to quantify, but Noah and I were college classmates and he graduated number one in our class. So I think we've got it. Um, so 
we are already one. As I reflect on my time in the United Kingdom, when I get there, there's the debate around Scottish independence, and then we have the Brexit debate, and then we have the election that we all just went through here in the United States. And I think it is fair to say, Karen, trying to practice some British understatement from my perspective during my time, it was not overly united. <laughs> <laughs> and this was brought home to me when uh, one of my favorite parts of the job, I'd put on a suit, and forgive me for not wearing a tie, I used to wear a tie as a diplomat, and then I would put on this little lapel pin. And you can't see it from there, but it's a US flag and a Union Jack, and uh, we make them at the State Department for all different countries. Every possible combination is called a friendship pin. And I loved it, and I kind of suit up every day. Um, and my first trip out of London was to Edinburgh. So I arrive in Scotland, and our wonderful person there sees it, looks kind of shocked at my lapel pin, gently removes it, and sticks on a new one. This is a US flag and a Scottish flag. Lesson learned. I go back to London, then I take my first trip to Cardiff. I'm in Wales, same thing. The young man there takes it, swaps out my lapel pin, uh, and puts in the Welsh flag and the American flag. Um, and then now I finally learned my lesson. I show up to Belfast. I don't wear anything, and I meet the guy, and I was like, all right, hook me up. Give me, <laughs> give me the lapel pin. No, no, no. No flags here. No lapel pins. And then I go get a tour of Belfast, and I see the peace walls. Some of you have seen them. Many here in this room and many outsiders might think, peace wall? That's an oxymoron. It is not to many, many people who have lived through what they have lived through. So as I thought about what we were going through and this apparent lack of unity, and so often, and look, this is on both sides of the political spectrum, on both sides of the Atlantic, too often, too many people were talking at each other, they were talking past each other, or were still not talking to each other at all. And I struggled with, and still struggle with, how might each of us and how might I do something about that? And in my time there, I tried to um, follow some great advice I was given uh, right away when I became a diplomat. I got to go meet with newly elected President Obama before I went off to serve in Sweden. And uh, we sat down. I was sort of uh, where Karin is, and he was where uh, Bill is. And I really only had one question, so I just kind of blurted it out. Um, Mr. President, what advice would you have for me as a first-time ambassador? And he sat back, and he looked up at the ceiling, and he said, well, Matthew, listen. And I thought to myself, yes, I've come all the way from Louisville. I was planning to. I have a <laughs> notebook and a pen, and it was sitting there. <laughs> and I was ready to write down all his pearls of wisdom, and that's all he said. <laughs> and you guys are significantly quicker than I was. Um, <laughs> And of course, his advice wasn't listen to all my great advice. His advice was listen, listen. And I tried to do that. And when I got there, I thought a really important group of people to listen to were young people. Because although I was the youngest ambassador ever appointed to the job, I knew that I wasn't young. I was, in fact, old. Now, one way you can tell you are old is if you refer to young people as young people. <laughs> So I decided to go out and meet high school seniors. That's that wonderful age group that they know a lot, but they haven't figured out what they're doing for the rest of their life. So I would go do workshops. We'd get 100, 100 high school seniors in a room. They didn't want a lecture from an American diplomat. I certainly didn't want to give one. Now, I am the son of a therapist and the husband of a therapist. Uh, and Brooke is uh, a specialist in art therapy. So I basically did group art therapy with these kids, but I didn't call it that, because that would be creepy. Um, <laughs> To them, I think. I love it. So anyway, I'd give them all a piece of blank piece of paper and a pencil from the embassy, and I'd say, please draw for me a picture of something that um, frustrates or concerns or confuses you about the United States. So they'd draw me the pictures, and we heard guns, racism, police brutality, and towards the end of my time, Trump and walls. And then i say, flip over the page. We spent about 50 minutes on the tough stuff, and then flip over the page and please write down a word or a picture of something that you like or gives you hope or inspires you about the United States and what we're up to. And we'd hear freedom, American dream, diversity, opportunity, and food. <laughs> so I did it. By the end, I did 165 schools, 20,000 students. 
uh, who had all done this workshop. And in some ways, they were all the same. And in many wonderful ways, they were all different. But I always ended with the same image. And uh, I didn't want to inflict PowerPoint on anyone here, so you'll have to just stick with me. I would start off with one circle. And I said, way back when, we were one people. And then I split it into two circles. And I say 1776 and all that, and then 1812, we split apart. And now, and then I drew a Venn diagram with the US as one circle and the UK and a nice overlap between them. Now we are two countries working together as one. I thought it was a kind of a nice, simple way of doing it. And I said, look, and look at all the important stuff we've done in the middle, things we're really proud of, World War I, World War II, Marshall Plan. They live in that overlap. So does what we did together to combat Ebola in West Africa. And let's be honest, the Iraq invasion lives there too. And let's talk about what we've done together. And at the same time, let's acknowledge the parts of our countries that aren't in the overlap. What are the things about my country that British people, I think, will never fully understand? And I suggested guns. It's controversial, it's constitutional, it's deeply cultural. I've tried, it's hard to explain to British students. And then I asked them, what are the things about your country you think we Americans will never fully understand? And you get some silly ones around Marmite and cricket, and then you get some really serious ones around class. Yeah. So I am mindful of the clock up here. Well, no, because it, yeah, it, it, it wasn't the same yeah. amount of time that I was no. told to do. It, it, the clock it gave me five just, minutes. Yeah, just. <laughs> We're OK? I can keep going? Yeah. yeah. Yes. OK. Uh, um, uh, it's sort of intimidating. It's blinking at me. You've got to see it up here. It's, uh, it's a shaming exercise. But uh, I, I will continue with, with, with your blessing. Um, OK. So. Uh, that Venn diagram that I showed to those kids is also kind of the cheat sheet that I would bring in to every TV interview because any of you who've ever served in government and ever been handed talking points, it makes, you what, it makes you wonder what is the point of talking. So I would draw a little Venn diagram and this was two weeks before our election here in November. The only two things viewers cared about and journalists cared about were Brexit, which had just happened, and, uh, or the referendum had just happened, and Trump-Clinton. These are two things I can't in any meaningful way say anything remotely interesting about, because as a diplomat, you can't get into UK party politics and you can't get into US party politics. So it was going to be pretty bland. And in the course of my not very good interview, uh, I basically went to the Venn diagram and the overlap. And I was like, look, we're best friends as countries, which is sort of an, I thought, unremarkable, uncontroversial thing to say. No big deal. I survived the interview. I went back into the car and I picked up my Blackberry. And I looked at my email. And I gave out my email address to all 20,000 high school seniors. I gave it out to anyone and everyone who would listen. Very few people actually email, especially young people, because they don't do that. But um, so I get this email from this guy named Mark. And I don't recognize the name. And I open it up. And I just want to share with you what Mark wrote to me after having watched my interview that I thought was not better than fine, but certainly fine. Matthew. Just seen you on Sky News. Who exactly have you asked in Britain to check that we are still best friends? Was it someone in London, or did you bother to ask a bricklayer in Birmingham? Or maybe a waiter in Leeds? How about a fisherman in Grimsby? Or was it a shop assistant in Truro? No, I think not. You do not have a clue what the ordinary average non-establishment British person thinks the United thinks of the United States, and you and your boss Obama tried to threaten the British people. We do not take that lightly. We had weighed in, by the way, on hey, it's not up to us, but we think the UK ought to stay part of the European Union. Um, you have done more damage than you can imagine. At least Donald Trump backed the right side. If you want to utilize your one-sided extradition treaty and have me rendition to a supermax prison on some trumped-up charge, I am not hiding Mark. <laughs> so I think uh, my first reaction was like, uh, I'm just going to ignore this. Uh, and then I was like, no, no, no. He has my email. Like, I should write him back. And then I started tapping out the first few words of a nasty flame back. And I was like, that's not good. Sleep on it. So I slept on it. And then I woke up the next morning and I wrote, hi, Mark. Thanks for reaching out. <laughs> I have so enjoyed serving my country and your country. As for your question, I have indeed been to nearly all the places you mentioned, over 155 secondary schools. 
um, where I have been able to listen to and learn from the future artists from Aberdeen, bricklayers from Birmingham, chemists from Cardiff, dentists from Dundee, educators from Essex, financiers from Fife, gardeners from Grantham, hoteliers from Holborn, inventors from Islington, journalists from Jarrow, kindergarten teachers from Kingston, librarians from Leeds, mechanics from Manchester, nurses from Newcastle, obstetricians from Oldham, policewomen from Plymouth, and I will stop at Q since that one's hard, and I think your point is well taken. It is so important that we all engage and not get trapped within walls of our own making. Thank you, Matthew. Mark writes back, okay, thanks for the reply. I still revert to my original point. You and your boss made threats to us and rest assured we will never ever forget those. And perhaps this could be a, construed as a wall of mistrust and a wall of your own making. You seem like a fairly nice man, just misguided. <laughs> All the best, Mark. So then I, I think I've done my job at this point. Now the election happens, and I'm up all night, as many here were, but it's you know, five hours later there, so I, I'm up all night, I'm trying to do TV interviews and, and be coherent, and I get this uh, uh, Mark, uh, email from Mark. Hey Matthew, remember me? <laughs> you kindly replied to my email a few weeks ago. Do you have any idea who the new US ambassador to Britain will be um, now that Donald Trump has won? P.S. If you are looking for work, I hear they are looking for bricklayers for a big wall that is going to be built in Texas. <laughs> Yours, Mark. Hi, Mark. I do remember, of course. As to your question, I don't know who President-elect Trump will appoint to replace me yet. Typically, those things come out around February or March. My bricklaying skills are, how do I put this, not overly impressive, <laughs> but we have bridges to be built, literally and figuratively, back home in Kentucky. So that's where I'm headed, and I will try to do some of that important work there. Best regards, Matthew. Dear Matthew, great answer. It has been good fun to banter. But seriously, I do wish you all the best for the future, and hopefully no hard feelings. Off subject somewhat, you said that your home is Kentucky, and it reminded me of the brilliant Bill Paxton line in the Tom Cruise movie, Edge of Tomorrow. Cruise says to Paxton, you're an American, right? And Paxton replies, no, sir, I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> Kindest, kindest regards, Mark. P.S. P.S. Before you leave, go down into the basement of your embassy in Grosvenor Square and look at the flooring underneath the rolling filing cabinets. I installed that about 20 years ago. I hope it's okay. So at this point, I now have to go meet my entire, in a sort of setting like this, my entire team from the embassy. Now this is right after the election, and it's tricky. They know my politics, even though I can't really talk about them and you have half Americans, half Brits. Half of the Americans are devastated because their person lost. Probably half are kind of excited because their guy won. And on the British side, I don't know, maybe 80% are pretty concerned and 20% maybe enthusiastic like Mark. But it was tricky and I didn't really know what to say. So I just read them what I just read you. And at this point, and I said, look, Mark, the bricklayer from Birmingham laid tiles down in this basement. I'm gonna go see if they're still doing okay. And if they are, I'm gonna send them a selfie. Could I just have you guys go reach out across your office or outside this building to someone who you don't agree with and try to do what I'm trying to do with Mark? So I went down to the basement. I found uh, the tiles. They're in great shape. Uh, my lingo around bricklaying is not high, but I talked to a guy on our team, and he's like, it's called chipboard and rail. So then I wrote this to Mark. Hi, Mark. Thanks for the kind words in your previous email. I, too, enjoyed our exchange. I went to look in our basement print shop. See the photo attached. Is this the cabinets you mean? If so, it appears your carpentry work on what looks to me like chipboard and rail um, <laughs> has, ha has held up perfectly for 20 years. Yours, Matthew. Dear Matthew, yes, all caps, two exclamation points. That is the place. It was hard work, but obviously work well done. Your picture really made me laugh. All the very best. I can now boast to my friends that I've had a good laugh with a Democrat. Very best witches, Mark. So, Mark and I are in email touch to this day. <laughs> and he emailed a couple weeks ago, and he caught me on a down day because I had read the newspaper. <laughs> and I told him that, and I just was sort of in a low spot, so I emailed him, and then he sends me back uh, a picture of a dog. And he said, this is my dog, Dixie. She cheers me up every time I'm down. Hope it helps, Mark. Oh. So in what ways are Mark and I won. That's my question I'm interested to hear from this panel. Um, no one won the argument. 
And as I think about it, and I prepared for this discussion we had today, I had this pamphlet that all of you had, this beautiful pamphlet here. You know, this one with the sun? And I doodled on the top of it, we are indeed one, but not like the sun. And I thought not like the sun because the sun is one circle. You're either in it or you're out of it. Um, and I thought, you know, I love Venn diagrams. It's a great tool for diplomats. And I thought, what is the right image that as I contemplate oneness and an image that recognizes the unity that I feel in this room and at this festival and yet accounts for the disconnects we see all around us and accounts for the diversity we cherish? And I think we have another image, and it's right there, this wonderful image here. So Bill talked about and read from Shakespeare. Uh, I'm going to inflict, in closing, uh, a couplet of bad poetry written by yours truly on the front of my thing as I prepared for this. We are indeed one, but not like the sun. The shape of our power looks more like a flower. Thank you. <laughs> So, Ambassador Matthew, welcome home. Thank you. Good to be back. Welcome home, indeed. And, and um, uh, you, you've shared a, a story, but um, uh, like every really deep story, uh, we're all pointed by it. We're all oriented by it. And um, so we, we thank you. I ask any panelists if you have a comment uh, you'd like to make uh, following Matthew's uh, reflections with us. Well, how to follow that? <clears throat> um, <laughs> in what way are you and your correspondent one? I would say in, number one, reaching out to one another. Number two, a sense of humor, uh, which helps mm -hmm. to bridge these mm. awkward gaps. Um, number three. Uh, a power to use language, both of you had that in your different ways, um, and language is our chief way of somehow communicating, even if we are mm. uh, sort of, uh, so we, as we struggle for, uh, we don't want uniformity. Mm. We want the, 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 the flower, uh, but you made that contact um, and you bothered to follow it up. A lot of people would have just uh, cleaned it out of their mm. inbox. And I think that, that, that that's the exemplary thing, really, to, to take a challenging and, uh, and develop a friendship um, and enjoy the diversity. Thank you. Noel, any comment? I mean, it was a stunning account, and I, I loved listening to it. I guess my, um, what strikes me about it is, that, is how much your, your correspondent wanted recognition. Mm. I think that's a deeply human impulse. And we have some sense from the circumstances about why he wanted recognition. He started feeling unrecognized. Mm. And you recognized him. And you did it in a very gentle and elegant way so that he didn't feel that you were saying, aha, check the recognition box. <laughs> That's what's so tricky about it. If someone says, recognize me, there's always an instinct to say, okay, you know, you know good doggy, I'll recognize you. Yeah. That's, and that fails completely. Mm. So I, that seems very, very powerful to me. And I was sort of wondering, did you get recognized in the exchange? That's what I wanted yeah. actually to ask you. I mean, you, you oh, did, did your I job feel? as a diplomat spectacularly. And Mark felt very, very recognized to the point where he could identify and connect with you and it turned out he'd built your house. But I'm wondering how, he, how you felt about it. Of course you did your job. I mean, it was, the, it was the spectacular display of diplomacy. But how did you, how do you feel about it? I thought when I skipped in the interest of uh, time, and thank you, Noah, and thank you, Karin, for, uh, uh, so we, we, had, we keep emailing and there's lots of other stuff that, um, and so the Times of London wrote up a whole story about this. And they wanted to go talk to him to prove it was true. Uh, and so I talked to him, and it was this wonderful moment where he says, I'm paraphrasing here, but like, I like 
journalists about as much as I like aluminum siding salesmen, <laughs> which is not very high. Um, and then he has this wonderful moment, Noah, where he says, Especially for you, a know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. you know what, Matthew? I trust you. So if you think it's okay, I'm okay. And that to me, to answer, is like, whoa, okay, then I felt really recognized. And that's not in the official exchange, but. Well, thank you. So, M Matthew, just to, just to an observation, the dynamic that you uh, shared with us uh, has, a, has a, a, um, a presence in all sorts of unusual places. When I've been working in conflict resolution, among the conflicted parties, after a degree of serious engagement, and notwithstanding their profound differences, and even the injuries of their communities, I've seen them do uh, something similar to what you displayed for us, even to the point where one will defend the other against that other party being misunderstood. So you've touched something very central, I think, uh, for all of us, and it gets us started uh, okay. this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>